All right, thank you again for joining us everyone uh, for this evening's presentation with our Young Scientist Speaker Series um, with Silka Bach-Huber. Um, and she's gonna be sharing with us about two small predator species uh, and how they compensate for the loss of the ochre sea stars in the inner tidal after sea star wasting. Um, we do host this series on the second Tuesday of the month, October through April. And so our next presentation is on January 12th uh, with Megan Wilson, and she will be talking with us about the early life stages of the Cabazon. And real quick, before we get started with the presentation, I just wanted to go ahead and introduce the collaborative. My name is Tara Dubois, and I am the communications coordinator for the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. And our vision is to foster conservation and collaboration within local communities. Um, and our three guiding principles are community engagement, leveraging resources, and engaging in partnerships. Um, our founding partners uh, at the bottom here, you can see their logos, are a group of federal agencies, state agencies, local nonprofits, and the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla Indians. And our focus is around the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve, Oregon's largest marine reserve, um, and with the marine protected areas to the north and south, uh, protected waters stretch from Yahats to Florence. Um, and I always like to give a fun fact, and this week's fun fact is um, around the research in the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve, um, and what they're looking for are the trajectories of change inside the Marine Reserve and how it compares to similar areas outside of the Marine Reserve. And the comparison areas for the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve are Seal Rock and Topeti. And we also host a variety of community science projects you can see listed here. Um, some of them are seasonal, many of them in the summer, and some of them are monthly, such as our beach cleanups. Um, you can check all of these events out uh, as they get scheduled on our website at kperpetualcollaborative.org and just click on our events tab. Um, and the calendar will pull up there where you can see everything that's been scheduled. Uh, we are also hosting a Cape Perpetual Winter Speaker Series on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. through March. Um, and so those uh, presentations are listed there as well. And it would be great uh, if you connect with us on our Facebook page at Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. And then we've also got a YouTube channel uh, for the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. I am going to be recording this presentation. And so the recording will go up on our website and our YouTube channel by midday tomorrow. Um, and you, if, if you have registered for this uh, presentation, you will receive an email with those links. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker, Silka Bach-Huber. Uh, she's a PhD student in the Menge Lubchenco Laboratory at OSU. And uh, her research is focused on understanding the impact of sea star wasting syndrome and climate change on rocky intertidal predator communities on the coast of Oregon, California, and New Zealand's South Island. She's broadly interested in the effects of ocean acidification and warming on coastal marine ecosystems and how scientists and community members can work together to conserve vulnerable ocean ecosystems. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and Silka, you can take it over from here. And while she's pulling up her presentation, I forgot to mention, um, we will do a Q&A after her presentation. And so if you wanna put your questions in the Q&A section, we will get to those and answer those at the end. Enjoy. All right, hey everyone, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you so much, Tara, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, as she mentioned today, I am here to talk to you a little bit about some of my dissertation research um, around Cape Perpetua and along the Oregon coast, uh, which focuses on two small predator species and how they were affected by sea star wasting syndrome. Next slide, maybe. There we go. 
Um, so today I'll focus on a number of topics, but I'll start out by introducing myself in a little bit more detail and telling you a little bit more about who I am and sort of how I got to the place where I am today uh, to be coming to you from Corvallis from OSU campus um, to talk about my research. And then I'll talk a little bit about rocky intertidal habitats and uh, nerd out a little bit about why I personally think they're so cool and some of the research that is ongoing in this these really unique systems. Then I'll talk about sea star wasting syndrome, um, predator effects in the intertidal, and then finally touch on some of the broader ecological effects of diseases in the ocean. And I'll hopefully have plenty of time at the end for questions. So as Tara mentioned, and before I start talking about my science, um, I wanted to say that I'm a graduate student at OSU. I'm in the fifth year of my PhD, um, but that's not the only hat that I wear. Uh, I'm a Pacific Northwest native, and I really love uh, exploring the Pacific Northwest, hiking, surfing, diving, um, hanging out with my dogs, and I also love to travel and ski. So I'm a, I'm a whole person outside of my science, but my science is a really important part of what I do. Um, like I mentioned, I'm originally from the Pacific Northwest and grew up tide pooling. I was super fascinated and really interested in all the things I could discover in the tide pools. Um, and that was one of the things that really drove me to marine science um, from an early and, as you can see, vaguely embarrassing age. I went through some old photos. My mom was very excited to send me these for my talk tonight. Um, one of my relatives got me a, na a National Geographic subscription, and I decided that my career goal, what I really wanted to do, was dive on tropical reefs and discover new species of nudibranchs. That was all I wanted to do with my entire career. And I was lucky enough to get scuba certified back in 2010, and I also attended a high school in Seattle that had a marine biology class. So after that, I was totally stoked, knew what I wanted to do, and looked at colleges and the college search process with marine science in mind. And that's how I ended up traveling uh, not too far west, but quite a bit south to do my undergraduate degree at the University of California, Santa Barbara, which is not a bad place at all to study marine science. Um, I had a total blast while I was there and got involved in undergraduate research pretty early. And I had a ton of opportunities to study a bunch of really cool stuff. I worked on the impacts of climate change and ocean acidification on larval abalone and sea urchins. You can see me bending over some buckets on the right. Those contain um, little tiny baby abalone uh, under various pH treatments. And I got to do tons of field work and diving. And this is where I learned a lot about climate science and realized how important it was that my work incorporated the impacts of climate change on our oceans. And after four years in Santa Barbara, totally loved it, but knew I wanted to get back into the Pacific Northwest. And so I applied to do my PhD at OSU with Bruce Menke, my advisor, and started in 2016. And my research is focused on understanding what determines how communities or groups of species respond to changes like climate change and disease outbreaks. In Oregon, I study how the intertidal is responding to sea star wasting syndrome. And I'm also lucky enough to work on the South Island of New Zealand, studying ocean acidification and how it affects predators in the rocky intertidal. My lab group is also part of a research consortium called PISCO, or the Partnership for Interdisciplinary Studies of Coastal Oceans, which is a consortium of four universities along the West Coast, focused on studying the West Coast large marine ecosystem and understanding how it works and what's affecting it. And I bring that up because the work that I'm sharing with you today wouldn't have happened at all without their help. And to highlight that science doesn't happen in a vacuum, it's a very collaborative endeavor. Now that you know a little bit about me, um, I also want to talk a little bit more about our research group. Um, I am a member of the Mingyu Luchenko Lab, as I mentioned, and we focus on community ecology, not just sea stars. I like to describe community ecology by saying that ecologists are the ultimate nosy neighbors. We really like to know who lives where and why. So as community ecologists who work in the intertidal, we study which animals live in different places, um, both along the coast and in different intertidal zones, and try to understand why they live where they do. We monitor things like species abundance and diversity, conduct experiments to understand the why of patterns that we observe, and monitor ocean conditions like pH, temperature, salinity, and even the amount of light intertidal algae receive. So we are all connected, um, and a huge component of our research is centered around why sea stars are important and how they have been affected by sea star wasting syndrome, as I know that likely many of you have heard of that before. 
Um, but one of the things that connects us and that I'm sure connects me to the rest of you is that we love intertidal ecosystems and consider ourselves incredibly lucky to be able to work in them. And Oregon's rocky intertidal is often a story of place, even if we're speaking more about our research explicitly than about the places where we work. And I wanted to sort of highlight or mention and acknowledge that the Rocky Intertidal in Oregon is so unique, it's so beautiful, it's incredibly rich in species, and it provides many ecosystem services to people, including food, recreation, and shoreline protection. So these are really cool systems. And we work in them for a number of reasons. The first being that they're highly diverse. There's tons of really cool species here to check out, as I'm sure many of you know. They're unique in many ways. Um, and they're really important to people. They also have a high density of organisms along a gradient of conditions. And one of the analogous stories I like to tell here is that um, when you move from the low intertidal to the high intertidal, organisms that live there experience really different conditions in terms of how often they're exposed to air, um, the size and type of waves they're exposed to, all kinds of stuff. And a similar gradient of conditions on land um, to study that would involve, you know, running a transect or climbing all the way from a, a grassy plain at the bottom of Mount Hood all the way up to the snow-covered alpine mountain areas. So we have a high density of organisms along a really severe gradient of conditions um, with their small, we have high replication, and it's relatively easy to get out there, even though it can be kind of wavy and scary at times. And we work at Cape Perpetua specifically for a number of reasons that I also wanted to highlight today. Um, Cape Perpetua is one of Oregon's main uh, rocky capes, and it's also unique in a number of ways. It's one of the most biodiverse coastal habitats in the Pacific Northwest, encompassing both our subtidal, intertidal, and diverse coastal terrestrial habitats. And it has a wide coastal shelf, meaning that it has unique oceanographic characteristics and really high levels of recruitment of things like baby mussels and barnacles, which are super important for intertidal habitats, as I'll mention in a few minutes. Key perpetuous habitats, and broadly Oregon's rocky intertidal habitats and coastal habitats, are shaped by a process called upwelling. Um, upwelling occurs when surface winds blowing from north to south push surface water away from the coast and move warmer surface water offshore. This creates a space where deep, cold, nutrient-rich water is drawn up from deeper areas and replenishes the water that was pushed away. And this water is really unique and really special for a number of reasons um, and brings kind of both pros and cons for our coastal habitats. Upwelling is really sort of the fuel for the engine that is Oregon's highly productive coastal ecosystems. It provides nutrients for algae and especially kelp. Our big bull kelp forests are fueled by upwelling. It also provides those same nutrients to plankton, which are microscopic, um, as you can see in the picture in the center here, but when they bloom or congregate in really high, at really high population densities can have impacts that can be seen from space. As you can see from this NASA photo on the bottom right, all of that sort of teal color along the coast is a plankton bloom that was fueled uh, likely by an upwelling event that brought that cold nutrient rich water up to the surface. But that water um, is from deeper the deep ocean um, and sort of moves up along the continental shelf slowly as it's sort of wicked or drawn up by that surface wind movement. And it has two characteristics that can also have negative effects on our coastal ecosystems. And those two things are low pH. So um, there's a lot of decomposition occurring, which affects both the acidity um, as well as the oxygen content of the water. And that can create um, low oxygen areas, which we sometimes will also refer to as hypoxic areas or dead zones. And so these things threaten our habitats as we continue to impact our oceans um, through anthropogenic impacts. You know, we have things like ocean acidification worsening along our coasts. We are also observing warming in both water and air, as well as the development of novel events that we're referring to as marine heat waves. A marine heat wave that you might be familiar with was the blob that formed off of our coast in 2015. We also see hypoxia, again, which is connected to upwelling, like I described. Uh, over harvesting, and then finally disease. And scientists are working really hard to monitor these impacts and understand how our ecosystems will respond to them. We wanna know how the intertidal is already changing and what it will look like in the future. 
And a few years ago, we had a major disease event that brought marine diseases into the limelight, had some surprising effects on our intertidal habitats, and prompted a wave, pun intended, of ecologists to focus on studying the poorly understood impacts of disease events in the ocean. And you already probably know what I'm hinting at here, but uh, in 2013, people and researchers and community members along the coast noticed that sea stars of multiple species were dying. And I wanna say that this wasn't the first time that people had observed disease events in the ocean or even in their sea stars and close relatives, sea urchins and sea cucumbers. But this was the first sign that something big was happening along our coast. And as we continued to look and observe for more instances of these mysterious symptoms that we were observing, we saw that multiple species were affected, including species that are very important predators in the coastal habitats where they live. Um, so I've got a sunflower star and a giant pink star and uh, another sunflower star of a different species here to illustrate that. Um, but I even observed wasting syndrome in two deep sea slime stars from the genus Teraster that were brought up in a trawl sample in Friday Harbor, Washington in 2013. So this was a really widespread event that affected a large number of species. And unfortunately, one of the species that was most heavily affected was our local really uh, iconic predator, the ogre star or Pisaster ochracius is its scientific name. Um, and sea star wasting had devastating effects in the rocky intertidal. We saw up to 98% reductions in, in populations of our keystone predator at some of our sites. When they're affected by sea star wasting, the stars lose their grip, they deflate, they twist their arms, develop lesions, lose their arms, and eventually die. And I want to highlight how rapidly the onset of this can occur um, in, within an individual organism. So we went out at Strawberry Hill at around six in the morning. We were up bright and early to go do some surveys and we were surveying sea stars primarily at that point and saw this individual sea star that was barely hanging on by just a few tube feet. And after we'd finished working and we're hiking back to the car, my colleague paused at the same sea star to take another photo for comparison. And you can see that over the course of just four hours, this sea star really disintegrated from something that's recognizable as a sea star to basically just a pile of arms. And the temporal spread of, these of this disease event um, along our coasts happened really rapidly too. So this is some data from Marine, the multi-agency Rocky Intertidal Network, which I'm mentioning to highlight that this includes a ton of community science data um, and community survey data for people who are out looking at sea stars. And so you can see um, it spread through Oregon, California, and Washington. And we don't spend too much time on that, but the take home here is that many of our Pisaster died. Um, this is some data from our lab from seven sites uh, ranging across the three capes that we primarily study here in Oregon. Uh, two, cape, two sites on Cape Foulweather up near Lincoln City in blue. Uh, our, red, uh, our red color represents our Cape Perpetua sites at Yahav, Speech, Strawberry Hill, and down at Tokati Kluchman State Park. And then we have two sites near uh, Cape Blanco. Uh, one actually in the state park and another one a little bit south of there. So we saw these really significant declines in Pisaster populations. And we also saw those same declines um, in other areas. So this is a photo from uh, some of our collaborators at the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And you can see the striking visual decline in that beautiful band of sea stars that we often used to see <laughs> and are starting to see again along the lower edge of the mussel bed. So you can see that over the course of just a few days, um, we went from having tons of pies duster to not very many pies duster at all. And I, we care so much about pies duster for a number of reasons. They're iconic, they're beautiful, they're really cool to see, they're fascinating to study. Um, but I want to also kind of give another message that disease events aren't uncommon in nature and they're part of natural cycles and processes that we study. Um, you might be aware of diseases like white nose syndrome in bats, wasting disease in deer, or even a different <laughs> wasting disease that affects our seagrasses and eelgrasses, even in some of our local estuaries. Um, but we care a ton about the stars in part as ecologists because they're what we refer to as a keystone species. So a keystone species um, is similar to, if you're familiar with medieval <laughs> architecture at all, the keystone that holds up a stone arch. A keystone species is a species that by function of their presence in the environment 
alters the structure of that environment in a really foundational way. Um, because I go to OSU, I'll give another example of a beaver um, who might come across a fast moving stream and then fell logs to create a beaver dam, which creates habitat for the beaver and its young, fish for it to eat, etc. Um, but also foundationally changes the ecosystem that was there before from a fast moving stream that is highly oxygenated and supports a really different community of species than that of the slow moving um, stream and pond that exist after the beaver dam has been built. So it's not just the sea stars, um, but the sea stars role as keystone predators that prompted ecologists to conduct such um, really intense investigation into the disease impact on this predator. And the way, key, the, the way that Pisaster is a keystone predator in the intertidal is by consuming um, primarily mussels. By consuming mussels as well as barnacles and a ton of other species, uh, Pisaster are not picky eaters at all, but the, the important species that they eat really is mussels. Um, by consuming these two sort of functional groups of organisms, as we call them, they affect the competition between mussels, barnacles, and algae in the low zone for space. Those of you who are familiar with our rocky habitats know that they're very wave and current swept, and often you'll see organisms um, competing very intensely for just a little place to hold on or tuck in and you'll see crabs fighting for little hiding spots, that kind of thing. Um, space is really limited in the intertidal because we have such an abundance and diversity of species that live there. And so Pisaster really affects the competition in the low zone between these species. But Pisaster don't um, affect this relationship uniformly in the entire intertidal zone. Um, in the intertidal, we have a paradigm, sorry, it's just a little slow, called the intertidal zonation paradigm. And that's this idea that we can divide the intertidal up into three zones. The high zone is primarily occupied by mussels, or sorry, barnacles, and sometimes little kind of scratchy algae. Um, and that's the area that's most affected or most dry, uh, <laughs> most stressful. Um, and spends the most time out of the water when the tide is low. We have our mid zone, which as you can see in this photo is primarily composed of mussels. Um, and then the low zone is a really diverse habitat. Um, if you're out tide pooling, you wanna go on the really good low tides to check out all of the um, really neat animals that, that live down there. And the mussel bed is really important. It provides protection for lots of animals from waves, from sun, from air when the tide is out. And it provides a cool, wet place for animals and especially baby animals, juveniles that are especially vulnerable to hide. Um, but overall, it is less diverse. And through a lot of experimentation and research, um, we have got, gained a better understanding of what determines these, the differences between these zones in terms of their community composition. And so the upper limit of the mid zone, this muscle bed area, is controlled by how much stress the muscles can tolerate. You can see there's a pretty distinct band where the muscles stop up at the top. And if a baby muscle uh, settles higher than that or tries to live higher than that, it's simply too dry and too hot for them to survive. They don't spend enough time underwater feeding to support the amount of stress they experience when they're closed up high and dry while the tide is out just trying to live. And so we have this, um, stress control of the upper limit of the muscle bed in the intertidal. And then our lower limit is not controlled by stress, as we know that muscles can live all the way down into the subtidal, but is in fact controlled by predation. So Pisaster will forage up into the muscle bed basically as far as it can um, at low tide. So it, it has a stress tolerance too, can't, can't forage up too high, but it'll forage up high enough and consume enough muscles that it actually um, sets that lower limit of the muscle distribution and frees up space for other species to grow in the low zone. So we have this intertidal zonation paradigm, and then that with the, the keystone species hypothesis um, allows us to sort of predict what might happen in the absence of Pisaster or when populations of Pisaster are reduced, for example, due to a disease event. So in this case, um, the keystone species hypothesis predicts um, that we would have this very diverse low zone before sea star wasting sets in, where sea stars are consuming mussels and altering the foundational shape of the ecosystem by doing so. And then after sea star wasting, we predicted mussel takeover in the low zone. 
Um, and we expect them to see that all over the West Coast where prize aster were important predators and were affected. And so in addition to studying the sea stars and doing lots of sea star surveys, we were also measuring the size and the extent of the mussel bed at a number of our research sites while this during and after this outbreak of sea star wasting. And instead of what we thought we would see, <laughs> where um, the whole sort of map on the left would be red, indicating a really significant downward movement of the lower edge of the muscle bed, potentially all the way into the subtitle, um, we saw what we refer to as a mosaic of muscle takeover. So we saw that in some areas, the muscle bed moved down, as we had predicted, and in other areas, it didn't. Um, and this led to a huge <laughs> sort of rethinking or, or a lot of questions about why this was and prompted a ton of investigation into some of the mechanisms of resilience within the ecosystem that may have um, conserved the original ecosystem state, that sort of diverse low zone and muscle bed right in the middle in the absence of Pisaster. There it goes. Um, and so we, <laughs> started asking questions about these various mechanisms that could prevent the movement of muscles into the low zone and came up with a number of answers. And I won't get into all of them here, um, but there are some potential ways that these ecosystems could have been resilient. And there's some key species or predators that can confer this resilience. And so we thought in the absence of Pisaster that other potential predators would be able to sort of step in and compensate for the absence of the keystone predator um, and either potentially eat more or even increase their population size and sort of have a little bit of a, mus a muscle buffet or a muscle bonanza and prevent that downward spread. And so some of those predators that we identified as being potential, or as potentially being able to do this included ochre stars that had survived sea star wasting, the tough ones, um, and ochre stars as they're recovering uh, from this really severe disease outbreak might be part of this pattern as well. Um, birds like oyster catchers that consume mussels in the intertidal, other sea star species that do also consume mussels and barnacles, um, crabs, which can during high tide come up and forage in the mussel bed. And finally, we had predatory whelks as another species that we wanted to investigate as a potential mechanism of resilience to these ecosystem changes. And um, a lot of these questions were starting to be asked and we were thinking about them right around the time that I started my dissertation research. And this is kind of where my dissertation uh, work comes in and takes center stage in my talk. So I chose to focus on just two of these predators um, for some reasons that might be clear as I sort of explain a little bit more about my experimental design and the work that I did. Um, so I focused on two of them to conduct an experiment and I was asking about their effects on, on muscle bed formation and community composition in the absence of other predators. And so, drum roll please, the big reveal, my two uh, focal, focal predator species that have been my life for the last couple of years at the very least, um, are the two that I've listed up here. The first one, um, Lept Asterius, is a small six-armed sea star. They're usually about kind of silver dollar size or smaller on the Oregon coast. Um, that was not as severely affected by sea star wasting syndrome. One of the grad students in my lab uh, did quite a bit of work on this and found that the Leptosterius don't seem to waste nearly as much. They do a little bit, but they're not as effective like the way that Pisaster was. We didn't see that dramatic decline. Um, and they're a very cute, gregarious little species that occupies about the same habitat range, so that low to mid intertidal zone, and consumes very similar prey to what Pisaster consumes. And the only exception to that is that they can't eat really large mussels, obviously, because they're much smaller than Pisaster, but they do eat um, juvenile mussels and barnacles, just like Pisaster does. And then my second focal species is a little different from Leptosterius. This one's got a, a little shell that it carries around with it everywhere it goes. Um, and this is the channel dogwinkle, Nucella austrina. And these are pretty common um, in our rocky intertidal habitats. You might have seen them. They come in a wide variety of beautiful colors. Um, some of them are striped. Most of them are sort of in this gray, brown, black range, but I've seen them in purple and lemon yellow. If you sort of peek around, you might find a really fun one. Um, 
they are heavily, heavily abundant at our Cape Perpetua sites. And so this was another predator that we wanted to focus on and understand whether they could suppress that downward muscle bed movement um, when Pisaster wasn't around. And so you might be thinking, okay, we have these predators, but they don't exist in a vacuum, right? There's tons of other predators in the intertidal. Um, and you might be wondering how we isolate the effects of these two predators to study them. And the answer to that is we put them in what we called uh, the Welk Thunderdome on some of our more sleep deprived mornings of working in the intertidal. And so we took our two predators and placed them into these 15 by 15 centimeter stainless steel mesh cages for 18 months at 13 sites in Oregon and in California. Um, it doesn't hurt the predators to be in here. They, they don't mind it, they like it. Um, but as you can see, the roofs on the cages and the tight seal that they form with the rock allow us to include the predators only, we call this an inclusion experiment, and exclude all other predators and grazers that might be affecting the community structure or the, num the type and the species identity of organisms that then will quite happily settle and live inside those wire mesh cages. And so we added the predators, put the cages back, left them there, and over time we monitored them. So we measured the amount and the number of species and how that changed. And then we measured the growth of the predators inside of our Welk Thunderdomes. And I mentioned my lab in large part because this is a huge experiment um, that I could not have done all by myself. Uh, but I had an absolute blast working with the rest of our lab mates and kind of getting this done. We had a lot of uh, really fun, wild and crazy early mornings out in the intertidal monitoring this project. And today I'm going to present data from four sites in Oregon that are again located on our three main capes and include um, four different predator treatments that were part of the experiment. So. My sites are Fogarty Creek, which is really close to Fogarty Creek State Park up on Cape Fowlweather. Um, at, in the Cape Perpetua region, we have Strawberry Hill and Yahats Beach. Um, Strawberry Hill is the, the one just by the wayside that some of you locals might be familiar with. And then our southernmost site is Cape Blanco, which is located just west of the lighthouse in Cape Blanco State Park, if you've ever been there. And we had four predator treatments um, Oh, as I've shown over here on the right. And these are the little icons that I'll be referring to throughout the presentation to denote my predator treatments. So we had first a predator exclusion cage where we had no predators included at all. And that's for comparison, right? That's our control. And then we had two cage treatments that contained either only the Leptosterius or only the Nucella. And that's to understand their individual effects on the community in the little cage or Thunderdome, however you want to think about it, um, on, on the rocks that was underneath the cage. And then our final treatment is one that incorporated both predators to understand if there's potential for those predators to affect each other um, or if there's interactive effects between having both of them in there on the community composition. And I won't be talking as much about that tonight, um, but I'm happy to answer questions at the end if you have more questions about interactive effects between predators. And so um, I want to mention <laughs> before I get too far into the data that uh, we had a ton of data to process. Um, there were there's over 2000 photos um, for this experiment that need to be analyzed in terms of their species composition for the entire um, time, duration, and geographical extent of the project. So it was a huge undertaking, a huge endeavor. Um, it was delayed a little bit due to COVID. We don't have a lot of in-person lab work happening right now, but um, I want to highlight that these are preliminary results, um, but that what we've found so far is surprisingly cool. We have really diverse effects of predators, as well as some interesting differences between our sites um, in terms of both species composition and prey biomass. So first I'll show you some of our data, um, which focuses on the differences in community composition between sites. And when I say community composition, what I mean is this is um, the data from the end of our experiment where we took a photo and then quantified the number of species that are in the photo and their percent cover. So how much area they're taking up. And so this tells us a lot about um, both diversity as well as the amount of species that are in each of our plots at the end of our experiment. 
And the sort of figure that I have up here is a really complex type of community analysis called a non-metric multidimensional scaling plot. And we do not need to get into any of the sort of uh, nitpicky details of this type of analysis tonight. But basically, each of these symbols on the plot here represents a different plot in the experiment. And the distance between them uh, is representative of the difference in community composition, so the species that live there, um, for each of our sites. And so basically, two points that are closer together have a more similar, uh, more similar species than two points that are further apart. Um, and so it's sort of a visual way to describe the um, types of species that live there without me having to show you a hundred individual graphs of all of the species that I studied. Um, so it's just sort of a more visually appealing and visually simple way to describe really complicated community data of the type that we gather. That aside, um, what this graph shows, the sort of story here is really interesting. So we have this clustering effect between three of our sites, Fogarty Creek, our northernmost site here in blue, you can see is clustered over to the bottom right. Um, and that's associated with sort of two species categories, one being red algae and the other being bare space. So Fogarty Creek kind of is doing its own thing, a lot of algae and bare space in the plots at that site. Uh, Strawberry Hill on Cape Perpetua in green is clustered away from Fogarty Creek, and that's associated with um, dominance by primarily mussels and barnacles. And then in purple or lavender, our Cape Blanco site furthest to the south um, is really widely spread, unlike our other sites, and that's due to um, some really strong effects of treatment, experimental treatment, on community composition at this site. But overall, Cape Blanco is our most muscle dominated site. So there's this spatial variation between our sites um, in just sort of the community composition, the species that can be found there, which is not necessarily unexpected um, as our sites in Oregon do vary. And that's largely driven by larger scale ecosystem patterns in things like recruitment, nutrient input, the shape um, of the local coastline, both above and below the water and lots of other factors. But the other thing that differs for these sites in terms of uh, the community structure, again, the species that live there, um, is that there are different predator effects at each of these sites. So Fogarty Creek, which is our northernmost and algae and bear space dominated site, um, we actually don't find any predator effects at Fogarty Creek. Um, so there's likely not a ton of prey there for them to eat. We don't see a ton of predator effects there. But at Cape Perpetua, at our Strawberry Hill site, we found a significant effect of predation by nucella. Those nucella cages are different um, from the treatment or the control and the leptosterius cages. And it seems like predation by whelks is a really important component in determining community structure at Strawberry Hill. Conversely, at our southernmost site, Cape Blanco, it's actually leptosterius that has the big impacts on community structure. And our cage treatments that contained leptosterius um, had really, really different species living in them. It was just a little bit of algae and just a few barnacles uh, compared to our treatments that didn't have leptosterius, which grew a very large number of mussels very, very quickly. So we see these really um, surprisingly diverse, surprisingly unique uh, impacts of predators at the site level, in addition to the differences between those sites that are sort of part of the natural variation in intertidal habitats that we see along coastlines all over the world. And the second component of this experiment um, was our measurements of what we refer to as biomass. And that's just the weight of the organisms that are in the plots. And we found that predator effects on biomass um, were also really diverse and sort of more complicated than we expected or predicted, given our understanding of this system and the ecological theory that we had to base our experiments on. So like I said, at the end of the experiment, we scraped our samples, put them in plastic bags, brought them back to the lab and froze them. And then we sorted them into functional groups. And functional groups are just groups of species that all kind of do the same thing. So an example of that may be barnacles, where a barnacle functional group incorporates um, acorn barnacles, thatched barnacles, um, you know, four primarily species in the intertidal in Oregon, um, but we just call them barnacles in part because they are often broken and can be challenging to identify to species once they're in these samples that we've pulled. Then we weigh them and dry them in an oven, which smells delicious. 
an ode to intertidal um, potpourri all over our lab. We get accused of ruining the hallway uh, pretty regularly by our collaborators and um, people who have offices along near our lab space when we're doing this. It smells really good. Um, but we sort of endure that for the sake of getting a lot of really valuable and interesting information about the total amount of organisms in the plot. And it tells us we can actually calculate how much energy is available for these predators in terms of the caloric uh, content. If you have it from other uh, chemistry work, you can actually um, estimate the like caloric content available to a potential predator in a given experimental plot or something like that. Um, and so I'll show you some of the biomass data, um, but take a moment to sort of orient you to what these figures look like, because I've got a few of them. Um, this is a plot incorporating all three of our sites for which we have our biomass data done. Fogarty Creek again on Cape Foulweather, and then Yahats Beach on Cape Perpetua, and then Cape Blanco to the south. And you can see um, each of the columns represents a different experimental treatment. And then on the y-axis, we have the average wet weight per sample. And these effects um, on biomass of our predator treatments also vary widely at the site level. So Fogarty Creek has a really low overall biomass and lots of algae when we compare it to our samples. And this is a similar story to our diversity data. It's also interesting to see that there are more of our different functional groups here at Fogarty Creek than there are in our other treatments. We don't see predator effects here, um, but I also wanna point your attention towards the fact that our y-axis has changed. This is a lot less biomass than at our other sites, only about 60 grams on average per plots at the most. Moving down to Yahats Beach, we see plots that are primarily barnacle dominated. And we attribute that to the really high levels of recruitment that I mentioned quite some time ago that we see at Cape Perpetua. We have tons of barnacles and lots of mussels. Um, and the predator effects can be a little bit more challenging to discern. But we see significant effects of predation by Nucella here, which aligns with what we saw in our community composition data um, at Strawberry Hill. And then finally at Cape Blanco, we have a very similar story where in the absence of Leptosterius, um, our sea star predator, these plots are dominated by mussel monoculture. And in the control treatment, all the way here on the left, you can see that these samples, again, looking at the, the y-axis, are absolutely gigantic, um, averaging about uh, a little bit over a pound, which is quite a lot of biomass to sort through when you're in the lab with a, a tweezers and a sieve. Um, picking out all the little baby mussels. So we see this really um, pervasive evidence for Leptosterius controlling the lower limit of the mussel bed in the absence of Pisaster at Cape Blanco. And again, um, I want to highlight that these differences are really diverse between our sites, and that's um, not what we expected. And so our take home message from sort of this um, fire hose of data I've asked you to drink from tonight is that if we ask whether other predators can step in and serve as a resilience mechanism in the absence of our ochre star predators, we have evidence that the answer to this question is yes. We have identified some other predators that are able to um, consume mussels and prevent the mussel takeover when pisaster is excluded either uh, naturally as a function of disease of a disease event or by us specifically by putting a cage down over an area of the intertidal that the sea stars can't enter. But this response is really diverse and more diverse than we expected. And so this is what's motivating. This is sort of our primary or uh, very simple take home for today, but motivate this motivates my ongoing work in um, both finishing our sample processing to better understand how um, differences between sites and capes can inform some of the takeaway messages we're getting from our, our predator results, um, as well as continuing to analyze photos to better understand how the change in species over time differs between these sites. So all the data I showed you today was from the end of the experiment, but we know there's a lot of um, variation in conditions over time in the intertidal, and so that's another thing that we're continuing to investigate. And then um, not me, this is far outside the scope of my doctoral research, but we are doing additional experiments looking at the effects of other predators on mussel bed extent um, using a, a fairly similar sort of cage design. We have a lot of cages out in the intertidal right now, um, and so we're investigating that as well. 
But the broader sort of ecosystem level, perhaps takeaways that I wanted to leave you with tonight um, are sort of this broad understanding that the variability in the way that ecosystems respond to change is really important to understand. And that's so that we can do a better job of predicting how these ecosystems will change in the future. And they can, this type of information can also be really informative um, when we're making decisions about species and areas to focus on for conservation. Um, for example, the Cape Perpetua Marine Reserve. And then finally, these results are also really important in the context of a phenomenon known as trophic downgrading. And trophic downgrading refers to the fact that humans are affecting top predators around the world and top predators are being, being affected by things like disease, not just in the intertidal. Um, we refer to this as trophic downgrading as a reference to trophic levels, which is sort of um, the idea that we have different levels of energy that move throughout our food webs. We have producers and consumers and predators. And as you can see over on the right, we sort of tend to form those up into a pyramid. Um, and so if you cut the top of the pyramid off, if you remove those top predators, um, that's what we refer to as trophic downgrading. And there's a number of species that I've kind of shown here as examples of top predators in their ecosystems that have been affected by various um, human activities. But, um, and when those predators are affected, we expect to see really significant changes in the ecosystems that they live in and how those ecosystems function and the services that they provide to us. But the message of hope <laughs> that I want to share is that trophic resilience may be a mechanism by which we can preserve ecosystem services and ecosystem stability when those top predators are um, reduced in number or absent or recovering from something like a disease event. So disease events aren't always the most insurmountable catastrophes that we might see them as being or think that they are, and resilience can come from really surprising places. And the effects of top predator loss can in fact be mitigated by other species, especially in the intertidal in this example that I've shared with you tonight, but potentially in other systems as well. And I want to highlight that understanding these responses of our habitats to change, as well as the ongoing monitoring and understanding of these changes in our ecosystems is extremely important. And I want to encourage you all to keep an eye on your local ecosystem today. Um, some of the ways you can do that, uh, and another thing that I really wanted to highlight is it's something that's really important for the work that we do in our research group, um, is the importance of community science to both us and to our marine reserves, and some of the ways that you can contribute if you're interested. We have um, specifically seastarwasting.org for sea star wasting reports from community scientists. There's tons of survey opportunities, um, events like this one, so that you can learn more about what researchers are up to in your local neck of the woods, as well as um, bio blitzes and other group survey events. So if you're interested, I would highly encourage you to get involved. And I also included this to acknowledge that this type of data is super important to the work that I do as well. So um, you are helping us in addition to learning a lot more about the areas where you may live or work. And then finally, I'd like to acknowledge um, the, the science side of this. So my lab group, um, the project, the larger project that my project is a part of and all of our collaborators, all of our field and lab volunteers, we've had like 100 people now working in the field and the lab combined on this, um, my advisors and the research consortia of which I am a member. And with that, um, I think we have about 10 more minutes for questions. And I wanna thank you all so much for listening and for your time and attention tonight. Thanks. That was a fantastic presentation, Silka. Thank you so much. I will never look at the, is it Nucella, the dog weevil? I'll never look yeah. at them the same. And I do see them in such abundance in the Cape Perpetua area, but I just think, oh, there's a ton of snails here. You know, I don't even go beyond that. It, fantastic information. Really, really appreciated that. We did have some questions roll in, so I'm going to start tackling those for you. Um, what is the status of the ochre sea star populations now? Are they starting to increase? Yeah, thank you, Denise. Um, that is a great question. So the very short answer is um, yes, we are seeing some population recovery of Pisaster. The slightly longer answer is that we 
saw a huge um, surge of babies right around and after sea star wasting syndrome hit, and we're continuing to monitor those. Um, we call them cohorts, actually, just like college cohorts. Uh, we're trying. We're continuing to monitor those babies as they grow up. So we're not quite back into our zone of having giant sea stars all over absolutely everywhere, but we are seeing some really promising signs of population recovery. And the, the populations that we're tracking have had relatively low incidences of sea star wasting within them. So we're still seeing some sea stars with lesions every once in a while, but it's not catastrophic like it used to be. That's what we've noticed too when we've done our sea star surveys in the summertime, um, average numbers over the last couple of years, but this a little smaller still. <laughs> And the leptosterias are so adorable when you find them. <laughs> I know. They're very, right. very dear to my heart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, next question. Big green anemone populations appeared to be dramatically reduced around the time that the sea star wasting began. Are there other diseases happening in our region? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I am not currently aware of any other disease, marine disease outbreaks that we've identified um, and nothing in Anthoplura or in Cnidarians, um, specifically in anemones and their relatives. Um, that said, um, there's sort of two things. One, there's a lot of things that can affect the abundance of a species, things like sand incursion, um, disturbance, like big waves, they get scraped off of things, etc. Can, can all affect the abundance of sea anemones kind of generally, um, but I'm, I'm not aware of any disease outbreaks or sort of imminent things that we're monitoring right now. Um, but marine diseases are really challenging to study, really hard to monitor for a really large number of reasons. And so, you know, there's a, there's a non-zero event, like chance that there was a localized disease event that we weren't able to detect. Um, was the sea star wasting disease a new disease? And if not, what stressors caused it to become so prevalent? Yeah, that's a great question, Denise. Thank you. Um, the answer is a little bit long. <laughs> <laughs> um, there has been a ton of ongoing investigation, including by my PhD advisor, into the potential causes as well as the causative agent of sea star wasting. Um, and by causative agent, I mean something like a virus or a bacteria or a toxin that would cause the, the sea stars to waste, waste away like that. And the short answer is that we haven't identified a single causative agent for sea star wasting disease. Um, to date, there was some preliminary evidence that it might have been a type of virus called a densovirus, um, but that hasn't been replicated in other studies and with other species that were affected. And there's actually across the, there's so much variability across the huge range of the outbreak, we haven't been able to identify one thing um, like salinity or pH that is consistent across the scope of the entire outbreak. So there's not something where we can say, oh, we observe here that there was high salinity or low salinity, and then after that, the sea stars wasted. We haven't been able to um, tease out a causative agent like that. There is um, some evidence that the sea stars are, there's tons of evidence that the sea stars are affected by um, increases in temperature and there is some laboratory evidence that they waste faster at higher temperatures. Um, we're not sure that that's necessarily um, something that is related to the disease itself, but rather to the inherent to the sea star in the same way that if you are stressed out or really tired, um, you might be more likely to get a minor cold or a flu. Um, it might be similar for the sea stars where they're less able to fight off the disease. Um, when they're stressed by higher temperatures. And there's not a high temperature thing that precedes all of the outbreaks of sea star wasting or sort of the incidences of sea star wasting that we saw um, along the coast. So you sort of touched on a very like hot button data mine topic. Um, there's a ton more research about that, but those are sort of some of the takeaways from what we've found so far. Very good answer. Um, are the sea temperature gradients similar at the three sites? Yeah, um, so this is sort of a, another piece of my research. I'm really interested in climate and I sort of took on this very pure ecology, ecology disease motivated project. Um, there are some differences in sea temperature. Um, 
they're not it's not as simple as saying like one of them is colder, one of them is warmer, but they do experience um, differences in sort of the, we call it a regime, but the process of upwelling that happens along those sites. So um, Cape Perpetua is a really high upwelling um, area, right? We see a lot of upwelling there. There's um, some really sort of <laughs> crazy times during the summer where the water is really chilly and then goes kind of goes back to being a little bit warmer. Um, and we see a, a different upwelling process at Cape Fellweather and another different one at Cape Blanco and all the way down into California where the rest of my, ex my experiment is. So there are differences. Um, they're really kind of complex and dynamic in the intertidal especially. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> And how do you account for mosque shell versus living tissue and tabulating the contribution of biomass bio mass by mollusks? And then also great pre presentation, they say. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so basically what we do, right, we put them in the oven um, to essentially remove the vast majority of what we refer to as the wet tissue weight. So um, if you as a person think about kind of the difference between your weight when you step on the scale today versus the weight of just your skeleton, <laughs> we can look at the difference between our whole body mass and the mass of our skeleton after you've been um, dried out in the oven. That doesn't quite uh, translate as well to the human metaphor, but for the, for the muscles, we dry them out in the oven and then we subtract the weight of their shell or their skeleton. And that allows us to understand how much tissue weight, as we refer to it, is available for predators to consume. Really great questions, you guys. We have just a couple more. Um, why do you think you are finding different influences of predators at your three sites? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think there's a couple different things going on and it's actually really cool. I'm super excited uh, to continue processing the data and kind of get more insight as we get more data into what's happening. Um, I think one of the things is there's variation in the amount of prey that's available um, to those predators, which contributes to sort of the effects that they're even able to have, the potential effects of predators at those sites. Um, I think that the difference, which accounts kind of for the difference between Fogarty Creek and my other two sites that I've, that I've sort of worked data up for so far. I think for um, Strawberry Hill and Cape Blanco, a potential difference there is uh, a difference in actually the natural abundance of those predators. So like I said, at Cape Perpetua, we see a ton more whelks than we do Leptosterius. And when we did our predator treatments, they were soft at site-specific densities. So we measured the density of Nucella and Leptosterius at the sites and then used that to do our predator treatments so that it would be sort of natural as possible. Um, and so we had a lot more Nucella at Strawberry Hill than I think that function of having just more predators allows the, to, them to consume more biomass and um, sort of that's why we see that that nucella effect there whereas the lepisterius are just totally drowned out by all of the recruit barnacles and mussels that are coming in whereas at cape perpetual or cape blanco we had um, fewer nucella fewer snails in the treatments and um, I think the the leptosterious at Cape Blanco just have some like they've been drinking a lot of Gatorade. I don't know what they're up to. <laughs> they have a very strong like training regime um, that allowed them to eat just a ton, a ton, a ton of mussels. So I have kind of a partial explanation for that, but I think the leptosterious um, the leptosterious part will be um, and hopefully answered by. Uh, me continuing to work with and analyze the leptosterious growth rate data. I measured them as they grew from eating all those mussels in the experiments. And so I think they were just able to, you know, eat mussels and get really big and go to the gym and be really successful there in a way that they weren't at my other sites where they either didn't have enough to eat or were kind of overwhelmed by having too much to eat. Very cool. And then is there any evidence that plastic particles are a potential cause of the disease? Great question. Um, the short answer is that we don't have any evidence that plastic uh, can cause disease, but there is a ton of ongoing investigation done by um, a couple of my friends actually on how ingesting plastic or how plastic can affect um, the overall health of organisms. So there's not um, disease is generally caused by a virus or a bacteria, and we don't have evidence that, um, you know, 
plastic causes an increased disease susceptibility or anything like that, um, as far as I'm aware. But the microplastic sort of research field is developing incredibly rapidly. I would definitely keep, keep your ear to the ground for more information about that because I'm sure that it will be coming. Um, I know one potential area of concern is that microplastics can serve as vectors for diseases. So bacteria and viruses can attack attached to microplastics and as they move around the ocean, um, or even you know, larger pieces of plastic, and as they move around the ocean, they could spread diseases that way. Um, but I think the, the rest of your question has not yet been answered by science with the capital S. <laughs> and then real quick, just as we finish up here, um, how long was your study and was it during what seasons, if not year round? Yeah, so I installed the experiment in um, May of 27, no, sorry, May of 2018, and I removed it from the intertidal in September of 2019. So um, it ran for a year and a half, including um, summer of 2018, fall 2018, winter 2019, <laughs> spring 2019, and then summer and, you know, the first little bit of fall again of that year. So. Um, I spent Christmas in the intertidal two years in a row, which was really fun, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Surprisingly, Christmas Day often is that time of year is so beautiful. It, it, it turns to be many, many times. All yeah. right. Well, that ends it for our questions. Um, Silka, thank you so much for um, joining us. I'm getting seeing comments coming through a phenomenal presentation. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us live uh, this evening. And again, I will be posting this recording to our YouTube channel and our website if you want to review it again or feel free to share it. Thank you so much and have a really great evening, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night.